I think uh, the first question I see, are there are any thoughts on the sequence of treatment or the treatment train concept? I think all of you shared uh, a bit of that. Uh, uh, maybe we'll just go through each of yours real quickly and just remind us of that treat that sequence of treatment option uh, steps you go through. Uh, Mark, you want to start? Sure. The the sequence for polymer assisted, you know, fine solids removal is typically core solids removal, followed by the polymer addition and then the uh, separation of the liquid and solid, and then a dewatering step. Now that can be followed by other things, and there may be anaerobic digestion before that, but you know that in general is the the fine solids removal treatment step. Great, thank you, uh, Joe. You want to do the same? Yeah. So with the struvite system, uh, basically just need to remove the large particle solids initially, so we don't have those uh, flowing up through the fluidized bed, and um, that that's really it in terms of any pretreatment other than the chemicals. Okay. So then you had the chemicals and then the cone separation after that. Uh, correct. All right, Jeff. Well, I just would say for the geotextile bags, there's a couple of different ways you could do it. Uh, from the applications I generally look at, there, there's no uh, large solid separation ahead of time. They, they generally will do with the, the geotextile bags. They'll agitate the holding pond and then just add the chemicals and put it right into the bag. Uh, you could try to do a, a large solid separation ahead of time if you would like, but it is not necessary for this. Uh, I will say the more solids that are in there, the more chemicals, of course, that would need to be used. Okay. Uh, any thoughts on key control points or monitoring of key control points in the processes that you folks are dealing with? Uh, what's a, a key monitoring point that you need to look at? Uh, Mark, you want to start us? Well, a couple of things. Number one, for most of these systems, because you're metering in polymer, um, your key control point is going to be your flow rate. As your flow rates change, you're going to need to change that amount of polymer. And so measuring the flow, and then, and Jeff kind of touched on this, it's not as big a difference usually in an ongoing process where you're continually putting new material in as it is like when you're pumping out of a lagoon, but making sure if there's, if there's a lot of variation between the amount of solids, a key control point is the monitoring of solids that usually can be done on a total solids basis just uh cooking the solids down and finding out what the total you know solids are that is left but depending on how exacting you need to get and what kind of removal rate sometimes you may have to go to something that is a little more more complex but solids measurement and then flow measurement is is pretty key uh joe how about from your perspective your technology yes yeah, so um, the main things that are monitoring pH and uh, then, you know, dealing with flow rates of the system and, uh, and chemical addition. Um, a large part of that in installations that have been, or this system's actually been installed in wastewater treatment plants, that's all fairly automated. So it's kind of a plug and play situation. But, but the, the pH in particular is a, a key indicator of then how much uh, products in terms of chemicals need to be used. Okay. Jeff, what can you add? Yeah, not, not a whole lot different from what Mark was saying, but I, I guess uh, the, the total solids, if, if you get too high of solids, uh, the, the geotextile bag, you're just, your chemical costs are going to get too expensive and you may have a hard time getting it to flow through the, through the system. So uh, what, what I have found, there seems to be a sweet spot for these geotextile bags, anywhere from 2 to 5% solids. If you get in that range, they seem to, to perform very, very well. Okay, great. Uh, Jeff, I'm going to turn to you on the next question. Uh, you mentioned your jar test, and they're asking about are there any bench scale testing needed to help determine how much polymer is needed for a specific type of manure? Do you have anything else to offer on the bench testing? Well, I, I would just say that there are, uh, there, there's a, a whole plethora of, of chemicals out there. So you would need to see what's going to work best for your system. Um, and, and what I have done is it, I generally try to talk with others who are using uh, this, this type of technology or chemical separation 
or, or using the, the chemicals, the polymer additions. And then that kind of gives me a, some sideboards of what to look for. And then I would, would go test some, some various uh, chemicals on, uh, that would be associated with that. Uh, uh, one, one of the things I found that the catatonic, um, high density, long chain polymers tend to work better for animal manures. Okay, and I see Mark shaking his head, verifying that. Well, I, I've had a similar experience, but one thing I would share about testing, it's very important that you're testing the actual product that you're gonna be working with. I've had situations where um, companies have asked me to send them samples, and because the process was quite removed from when they did the samples, their positive bench top results were completely unduplicatable in the field. And so you really want to make sure that when you're doing testing, you're testing what you're actually going to be treating. All right. Anything else, Joe, to add? Or are you you're good here? Yeah, yeah, I'm good. All right. Uh, Next question are, is related to any thoughts on a planning process needed to evaluate polymer assisted dewatering processes for a specific manure. I guess, Mark, your thoughts about testing the on site with the actual product would be one answer to that question. Other things that need to be added to that? I think one of the things, and I'm going to talk about planning for a manure treatment system beyond this is really evaluating, and you touched on it in your, in your first slides, really evaluating what do you need at the end. Uh, because, you know, the, the goal is to get what you need without spending extra. And so, yes, we can make potable water out of manure. But most people don't need that. And so really understanding what you need. And then the second thing is understanding particularly when we talk about removing something, understanding whether you have resources to start the business to sell whatever you remove. I tell a lot of people that just because it has value doesn't mean it's gonna sell itself. And if you don't have time because of what you do today to suddenly take on a new business of marketing a solid material, you're not gonna recover the cost that you think you might. Has the company uh, been successful in removing duck manure solids? This is a question from Pete. I'm not sure what is meant by duck manure solids. Does that ring a bell with anybody? Uh, th that's actually a project that we've been uh, okay. looking at. Uh, we're, we're just trying to figure out if there's a way to, to remove some of the solids from, from the liquids with, with duck manure. I have uh, very little information out there. And so if, if anyone here has anything on that, that would be great. So if you found out anything on it, uh, please add that to the chat. That would be great. Okay. And I guess it's right after lunch and the duck manure didn't sink in at all to me there. <laughs> Sorry about that. Thank you for bailing me out, Jeff. All right. Uh, how does uh, one empty the solids from the geo bag? Uh, Jeff, I guess you mentioned that cutting it open, but essentially you had to destroy the bag to get access to that, that. That is the only way we have found so far to, to effectively take the solids out is you're going to have to destroy the bag. And that's, that's why we're looking at some of these other alternatives, such as these porous uh, tiles to see if we could continue, have a continuous process and continually use uh, the material over and over again. Okay. Um, that's been answered. Let's see. What is the impact of this? Okay, here's a good one. What's the impact of these chemicals that we're applying in each of these processes to the, the soil uh, for the follow-up land application? We have any concerns there, things we need to watch out for? Well, I guess I, I would just make, make a note that uh, I think Joe kind of touched on it and, and I touched on it a little bit as well. Uh, if you're using the chemicals, they tend to uh, bind the, the phosphorus uh, more tightly than uh, it was just, just the manure by itself. So it, it's more of a slow release fertilizer. So you kind of have to uh, do that test to determine how much of that is going to be available uh, in, in a given year. Uh, so you don't want to uh, begin to accumulate again more of the solids 
or more, more of the of the phosphorus the nutrients because of of this condition as well so you so you have to uh, do that testing to to see how much of that is going to be uh, readily available to the plants in any given year good thought real quickly the other um the other point is that many of these polymers are similar to the polymers that are actually used for um, soil remediation and to, so they, they do currently use polymers agronomically to help bind particles that, you know, in, in compromised soils. So there, there's a good bit of information out there if you look at um, using polymers in soils and the concentrations are really quite low. Um, in some of these continuous um, continuous recovery systems, because you're dealing with a very large volume usually of water and a small volume of solids. Okay. Uh, Jeff, uh, we have a qu another question up here on the geo bags. Uh, what is their cost? Well, again, it's gonna depend on the, the size of the system that you're dealing with. Uh, the, the one bag that, that I had there, which was uh, the 60 foot circumference, 100 foot long, uh, that bag at the time ran about $1,500 just for the bag itself. So the, there is a pretty significant cost associated with, with the bag, but it's going to vary depending on the size of the bag and, and the number of applications you're going to need. Okay, uh, there's a question in terms of the separation, of, it's like mechanical separations of solids that are being used in the bedding, and they're asking about the nutrient value of the liquid provided uh, is from the liquids that come out of that. Uh, my guess is that the liquids out of this can be all over the map in terms of their nutrient concentration. Um, is there any general statements that we can make there, or is it testing of the, the individual situation? most important concept. Well, I'll, I'll make a stab at that, uh, and then I'll let, let Mark, um, you know, it's kind of like what Joe, you know, he was saying they need to have a, a solid, se a large separation, core separation, before using the, the struvite technology, uh, extraction technology. So, so if, if you have low solids, and I can't remember, Joe, if it was less than 1%, or something like that, that uh, you could, could utilize this. You had to get that percentage down. Uh, I, I will say the, the, the geotextiles, uh, you can, you know, the, the two to, to five percent is seems to be the sweet spot for, for those to, to work well. Uh, others, you know, it does depend. If you'd use a membrane, you need to even have lower uh, concentrations because you don't want those membranes to, to, uh, to, to plug either. So uh, you, you do have to determine um, you know, the, I guess the, the concentration does impact which technology you're actually going to utilize. But I think it would be difficult for us to speculate for any mechanical separation what the liquid is going to look like in terms of nitrogen and phosphorus. So just a, a, a grab a good representative sample and do a manure analysis would be our best suggestion here. Particularly because of all the water that can get added. Yes. Even particularly in dairy, you might have scraped manure that immediately after it's scraped is, you know, eight to 10%, but, you know, flush manure immediately after it's collected, that's very close to 1%. So yeah. you're really going to have to measure it and then measure it after the separation technology has been applied. Okay. Uh, in starting with a relatively clean effluent, 200 parts per million phosphorus or 1% total solids, like many beef feedlots have, what would be the best system to reduce P even further? It's true by membrane technology or I guess any of the technologies we've addressed today? So this is Joe. Um well, I can't speak to what might be best. I can say that for the struvite, you need at least 50 milligrams per liter or that 50 part per million. Uh, for the struvite to go. So as long as they were above that um, and certainly being one less than one percent total solids is good. So um, My understanding is that would be a very good product for going to struvite um, technology okay. And I would just share that, you know, membrane technology also would, you know, give you separation and 
may be attractive depending on if you want to, you know, the advantage to Joe's process is you end up with a solid and it really reduces the volume. Membrane technology, you're still going to have two liquids. You're going to have one liquid that's more concentrated and one that's less concentrated. But uh, I would say that, you know, membrane technology would also work. And if you still need a little phosphorus, if you're going to cropland, then you could, you could also look at, you know, the different dewatering, uh, polymer-assisted dewatering, where you're still going to get a little bit of phosphorus, but you're going to end up with a tea water that you don't have to worry about plugging up irrigation nozzles and things like that. But, but I guess I would also say, uh, to add on to, to what's been said, remember a, a bee feedlot, when you have a rainfall event, you're going to have a flush. So mm -hmm. you've got to be able to handle that flush that's coming through the system. So you would have to take that into account uh, with, with it, whatever type of separation system you use. I'm going to ask a couple more questions and then we're going to wrap up today. Um, any concerns about toxicity to the environment? Uh, we've spoke a little bit of that. Uh, any concerns at all about toxicity in any of these products? I didn't hear any earlier. They're uh, like for, for the one that, that I, I spoke about for that, uh, the aquaculture system, they actually have an aquatic type of polymer that is specifically designed. To, to use with, uh, with fish and, and other types of, of aquatics. So I, I would recommend that they, they look at, at those. It, it's more of a, an organic, even though it's not uh, certified organic, it's an organic type of polymer. Uh, so uh, we really haven't seen any, any issues from that, from, from, uh, uh, from the aquatic standpoint. And I guess I would also say, we have not seen any issues from the chemical applications, any toxicities, uh, from from land applications either, uh, so I, I have not seen any issues related to that. And I'm gonna just hey, go ahead. Add that one thing you should be aware of when you're working around polymers is they can be incredibly slippery, and so from a safety standpoint, if you're working in areas where people are dealing with polymers, um, you need to be careful because. They're, they um, they get incredibly slick. Okay, good thoughts here. Uh, Jeff, I'm gonna turn to you to the last question. There was a question about cost of the geo bags and maximum size. Do you have anything to share along that line? At, at the time, uh, when, when we were doing the, the studies, the largest bag they had at the time was the, the 60 foot circumference, 100 foot long. Uh, you could get it down as small as, you know, a, a 10 foot circumference. I mean, they can go from that size down and it could possibly even make it even larger if you wanted. But uh, that, that's, uh, th those are the sizes that I've dealt with. Uh, up to 100 foot long, down to 10 foot long. All right. I think we're going to put a wrap on today's presentation. Uh, gentlemen, thank you very much for the excellent information you shared. Uh, I, I thought we got a really nice diversity of three different technologies, three different approaches, and probably three different types of operations that uh, could uh, each benefit from those. So excellent information today.